Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. On this Q&A, you'll meet Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, and Pedro Noguera, a Dean of the School of Education at USC. Their new book, Search for Common Ground, debates education policy and discusses the importance of having civil discussions over policy disputes. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Rick Hess and Pedro Noguera, your new book on education policy is called A Search for Common Ground. Thanks for joining us on Q&A. I wanted to start our conversation with where you ended up in the book, and that was uh, your experience on uh, and, and the discussion about COVID and how it might impact education. Both of you had experience with having young children during the, this last COVID year. What was that like for you, and how did it, if at all, change your thinking about how children learn and the process of education? Let's start with Rick Hess. Sure. Hey, great to be here with you, and great to be with my friend Pedro um, from uh, the Two Coasts today. Look, I mean, I think, uh, as you know, Pedro and I both taught in the last century. Uh, we were both parents. So we come to education with lots of pre-baked assumptions. For me, the biggest thing uh, wasn't that it changed my mind, but that it brought home two truths. One is that schooling is about so much more than mastery of content and cognitive skills. Uh, This was just a huge reminder of how much it's about making sure kids are developing relationships, are in safe and supportive social environments, are finding mentors. And then the second thing uh, that it really brought home was how many of the routines uh, that are involved in trying to get 50-odd million kids into buildings each day are not necessarily about making sure those kids are well-served or being well-educated. Pedro Noguera? Yeah, I I, I would say similarly, we saw very early that uh, virtual learning wasn't working for our daughter. She is very social. And um, she needs the interaction of her peers. Um, she needs to be present. And so we, we made sure we could set things up for her. Uh, we had the privilege to be able to do that with other families. And that worked well for her. I will acknowledge, though, there are many uh, families I know whose kids loved uh, virtual learning because they're shy, they're introverted, and they did a lot better. Um, but I think like Rick, what I also noticed is that many of the Uh, activities, the lessons that they were getting um, in virtual learning were not uh, particularly challenging or stimulating, just didn't hold the attention. And, um, you know, it makes me just question uh, a lot of what we do in school and and to the degree that that we are able to really tap into um, the interest of kids because, um, you know, too many kids, even before the pandemic, uh, were complaining about boredom and alienation in school and uh, this is something I think we've got to focus a lot more attention on. Well, staying with you, is it already clear at this one-year point that schools uh, and the education experience will change forever as a result of COVID? Um, I'm not sure about that. I, I think we're clear that many of the aspects of education that we deliver virtually, we could continue to do some of that. Um, I think about um, um, you know, kids who miss out on school, we can do a lot more with virtual learning. Uh, we can do some AP courses, perhaps with virtual. Um, but as I talk to superintendents around the country, what I hear is a real uh, focus on logistics and returning back to the way it was, which to me represents a lost opportunity. I think this is a chance to do some things differently, but I don't think they right now have the uh, space to start to imagine how it could be different. Rick Hess? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny. Pedro and I disagree on a lot of big picture policy things. The fur- the closer we get to the stuff of actually educating kids, I think the more common ground we tend to find. Two, two big issues here that Pedro just touched on. One, or I think we're seeing it right now, just the mechanics of trying to get kids in the building uh, tend to swamp the creative thinking about how do we staff smarter to support those kids? How do we use um, you know, members in a community, how do we use volunteers to make sure kids who haven't been getting what they need or getting additional support? All of this tends to fall by the wayside when it comes into positions and buses and budgeting. And then the second thing is what we, what, what those of us who have the time to focus on this new, but I don't think was immediately apparent to everybody, was that technology is fantastic educationally, 
when it's supplying particular needs. If you want a kid to get to watch something over and over, to pick it up, to be able to take a formative assessment, kind of the way technology gets used in, say, uh, by a high school football team uh, to help players study an offense and master a technique. Technology is phenomenal at that. When you're just trying to suddenly dump an entire third grade uh, curriculum online, it turns out technology is not very good at all because kids have lots of needs and lots of questions. The technology is not good at kind of meeting for every kid in every way. So I think part of what comes out of here is can we think, can we rethink how we go about staffing and organizing school to meet the needs of very different kids and families and their situations? And can we use technologies in ways that really plays to the strengths of educators and the needs of kids and what technology does well? And I think that's very much an open question. Millions of parents had their most immersive experience in being teachers this year. And I'm wondering if you think that will change teachers, excuse me, parents' views of teachers and schools and the kinds of questions they ask about their, their kids' education. Uh, yeah, I think absolutely, um, a couple, in a couple different ways. One, we know parents had very different reactions to kind of this experience into the homeschooling. Pedro already alluded to this. Uh, we know about 30 to 40 percent of families said, hey, they really want to have some form of this going forward. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of parents who said this was a nightmare. It was terrible for their situation, their family situation for their kids. So I think you see a lot of disagreement. And schools are going to have to find a way to meet the needs of millions of families who fall on both sides of that divide. I think for parents, um, one of the recurring questions was parents said, well, wait a minute. My kids already finished all their work um, by 1030 a.m. on this asynchronous school day when you're just going to the portal. What do you guys do all day? So I think there was a question in a lot of communities and a lot of schools about, well, wait a minute. Are our kids learning a lot less than I thought they were learning? And then another big issue, of course, is that when parents could kind of half keep an eye on what was happening in a classroom while they were working from the kitchen table, um, for a lot of parents, this raised concerns about what was getting discussed or what wasn't getting discussed and how it was getting presented. And I think all of these habits, um, at least for you know the next several years, are going to remain uh, you know embedded in people's experiences. Pedro Nogueira, your thoughts on how parents might be different? Yeah, I think uh, that many parents I've heard from have (laughs) renewed, uh, great, deepened their respect for teachers on this experience. They see how hard it is um, to keep the attention of kids. Um, Just think about the parents, I mean, the teachers, rather, who are also parents who were trying to conduct lessons while their own kids are at home. Uh, Incredibly challenging. So I think that is an important reminder of how challenging teaching is. At the same time, I think we also know that parents, if they were not paying attention to what their children were doing, a lot of times the kids became distracted um, and and did not um, plug in. And so there's, I think, a greater appreciation for how important parents are to the educational process, that being involved and supporting your kids is an essential part of the work. And something that I think we lose sight of when we simply send our kids to school and leave it to the schools to take, take care of it. Well, our viewers and listeners have already gotten a taste of what your book is like, the two of you uh, agreeing on some things but disagreeing on a a lot more on education policy. So uh, explain to uh, us about this book, A Search for Common Ground, how it came about and what you are doing with it. Uh, Let's start with Rick Hess. Uh, Sure. You know, I think Pedro and I started out on this uh, about a year and a half ago, late 2019, uh, during you know, I don't think it's any great surprise to any of us uh, that during the Trump years, it became harder and harder to have a constructive conversation um, about important areas of policy. Um, It felt, you know, especially in education, where we want to model for kids uh, what it looks like to engage as responsible citizens, where we have to make decisions about schools and programming and spending that affect Uh, tens of millions of children uh, across the land who haven't asked for us to weigh in, that in in those situations, we have a heightened burden uh, to behave as responsible, (laughs) you know, responsible members of society. And it hadn't felt, I think, that Pedro or I, like we saw a lot of that behavior, certainly not from the politicians, but not from the talking heads, uh, not from many of the leading authorities, 
And one of the frustrations is that when you're trying to engage in the usual avenues, social media, writing articles, writing op-eds, going on TV or radio, um, it didn't feel like there was a lot of room for a conversation where you could actually spend time trying to figure out where are we on the same page? Why do we disagree? Why? H- how could you be saying that? Because I don't get... So I reached out to Pedro, who I've known for about 20 years or more. Um, not super well, but I've always respected the heck out of him. And uh, he and I disagree on a number of major issues. And, you know, Pedro's on the board of the nation, and I'm a regular <laughs> contributor to National Review. So we tend to come at these things pretty different ways. Um, he's the dean of a major ed school. I'm director of ed policy at a major conservative think tank. And uh, we thought we would try sitting down and writing um, letter-like emails back and forth and see if we could work our way through some of these tough, tough issues. And uh, Pedro, I'll let you pick it up from there. Yeah, when uh, Rick invited me to join him on this project, um, I readily accepted. Um, and, and it's because I think um, it's so important to not merely dismiss those we disagree with, but to really probe the issues and, and to address them in the substance. And uh, anybody who spends time thinking about the, the issues in education that have polarized so many communities uh, should recognize that they're complex and that reasonable people can disagree and look at the same issues from different perspectives. Uh, and Rick is a person whose perspective I, I respected even when I disagreed with it because I think he, he bases his arguments on logic and on facts and not merely on ideology and opinion. And that's something I value. And so when, when he invited me to engage with him in this conversation, I accepted because I said, this is exactly what we need. And, um, you know, we both saw the way the country was polarized on so many issues. A lot of that polarization had crept into education years ago. Um, and, and it really prevents us from understanding and acknowledging that these issues are not simple. And you can't just use slogans to address the complex a- issues facing our schools. So I think readers will find that we, we listen to each other. We took each other seriously and we, we agreed where we could, and, but we didn't try to agree just for the sake of agreement. We also acknowledge where, where there are still significant dis- disagreements. What do you hope that uh, this debate in book format will do uh, to the education policy debate? Who do you want to read it? And, and where do you see Do you see this being a springboard for debates like this in other forums? Um, I'll take a crack at this first. Um, so a couple thoughts on this. One, you know, one of the things that I think I intuited when we started this, but that has become really clear to me, uh, is how much the mode of communication uh, can actually shape the content of what gets said. Uh, in, in education, like in so much policy and culture debate today, uh, we, you know, things tend to be driven by social media, tend to be driven by 24-7 new news cycles, and so it becomes very reactive. And when it's reactive, what you do is you look for the most outrageous example of misbehavior by people you disagree with, and then you critique that, and then you say, aha, I got gotcha. you. And this tends to feed on itself. Um, When you actually have an extended period of time to engage uh, without worrying about playing to the audience, it turns out you don't have to worry about being on defense at every moment or about being on offense every moment. You can actually ask questions and push back and understand and give each other room to breathe. And I don't think there's – I think in education more than anywhere else, that's critical. That, that ought to be integral to how kids learn about the tough issues we talk about in civics and so much else. It ought to be integral to college. Good Lord knows we need that in higher ed. It also ought to be integral to how we train people who become educators. Um, and right now, Pedro and I have spent a lot of our lives uh, in a number of schools of education. And I, I'd argue that there's very little of this kind of conversation in schools of education or in universities writ large. So I think this absolutely is intended to be a model that can be used to K-12 by the folks leader, leading K-12 systems, by folks in higher ed. Um, I'd like to think it would be useful more broadly, but look, let's be realistic. When you're a politician and you're playing to an audience of millions, there's lots of pressures which make it hard to do this kind of stuff. But when we're thinking about school principals, when we're thinking about people who, are, who sit on school boards, 
about people who are training the next generation of educators or working in colleges and universities. Um, this kind of conversation is not only wholly possible, it actually seems entirely a, 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 a of a piece with how we've historically understood their job. Pedro Nogueira, how do you hope to get this book into people's hands that can continue to, to foment this sort of debate in education? Well, I think there are many um, people, mostly at the kind of local level, school board members, superintendents and the like, who are looking for ways to figure out many of these issues that we address in the book um, and who realize that um, you can't just vilify people who disagree with you. You've got to listen. You've got to think it through. And then you've got to figure out, okay, is there some common ground? And that's what uh, Rick and I tried to model, that there is a way to engage in dialogue um, and, and to hear each other's perspective and, again, respectfully disagree when that's where we end up or um, to problem solve together. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think that uh, makes uh, Rick and I, I think, approach this differently is because we've worked with many superintendents. And when you're a decision maker, you don't have the luxury of just um, sitting on uh, ideology uh, to figure out what to do. You actually have to figure out how do you make things work in the interest of a community and when you're in that position, your pragmatism becomes much more important than ideology. And, and I think those leaders uh, would benefit from knowing that there are ways in which you can think through the issues and address them thoughtfully without just um, relying on sound bites and, and slogans. And uh, so hopefully they'll find this, this work to be helpful to them. And we've gotten a good response from many already. Well, you've alluded to a little bit of both of your careers, but, and your readers have a chance to learn more about what you've done. Uh, I want to give a brief opportunity to our viewers to learn a little bit more about you. I, I understand that you both started out as classroom teachers uh, long ago. Uh, let me start again with Pedro Noguera. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do today and why you have decided on a life in education policy. Yes, yeah, so today I'm, I'm the Dean of the uh, School of Education at the uh, University of Southern California. I've been in academia for 30 years, but uh, as you pointed out, I started my career as a teacher, uh, uh, first in Providence, Rhode Island, then in Oakland, California. Uh, and like Rick, I taught social studies. Um, and very early on, I saw two things. I saw, one, the power of teaching, uh, because as soon as the classroom door closes, the teacher has a lot of power. And that both frightened me, but uh, because I thought, I'm only 21, how could you give me that much power? But it also excited me because I loved teaching, I loved history, and I thought, wow, I get to uh, hopefully sparking kids a love of learning history. But the thing that troubled me was that my mentor teacher was much more focused on covering a book than he was about making sure the kids actually learned history. And that early on bothered me it because it, i know that history is not merely a collection of facts and dates it's understanding how they collect together to create the kind of society we have now and so that figuring out how to make education more meaningful more impactful um, for many kids education is the key to a better life and to more opportunity and it's the key to a more uh just society and so for me um figuring out how to make education more impactful um, is uh, it's been a driving source of my work um, for many years now. Rick Hess, what was the path from teaching to the, uh, what you're doing today in education policy? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I wound up in teaching um, mostly because I started substitute teaching for beer money back when I was in college. <laughs> and uh, used to ha had a schedule where I was off, I think, two days a week, maybe junior year. Waltham, Massachusetts started substitute teaching and Thought that was a lot of fun to be with the kids. And one day in the teacher's lounge, somebody said, well, if you enjoy substitute teaching, you're going to love teaching. I was like, That's, that sounds right. Um, so I tried it. I did it for a couple of years. Um, taught down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But unlike um, a lot of my friends who stuck with it, I just never had, uh, never had the willpower to muscle through all of the bureaucratic frustration. Uh, from being reassigned to the first school I was at 48 hours before the first day of school um, because an opening finally suddenly appeared uh, to being brought down to start the third AP economics class in the state and then being told, yeah, no, we're not going to order the books. So one thing after another, after about two years of it, I said, this doesn't make any sense. There's nothing that at a gut level 
is more fun or more rewarding for me than to hang out with a bunch of 14 year olds talking about, you know, civics and world geography. I mean, these are great, interesting things. These are fun kids. And somehow the system has managed to make this work feel like miserable, frustrating drudgery. So I, I went back up to try to get my mind around this, did my PhD studying these things. Um, I became a professor for a little while. And uh, I wound up at a conservative think tank because I found academe fairly stifling. And so for me, I, I tend to travel in a world of education where most people are significantly to my left, which means I have a lot of exposure to people who tend to come at important questions of school choice or for-profit operators or what have you differently. But we don't necessarily have nearly as many thoughtful reflections on why we disagree as you know, as I, I think I would have hoped once upon a time. Instead, it tends to be more either here's why we disagree, or can we come up with some uh, some fuzzy enough words that we can put together a consensus document to move past this UX. And uh, you know, this experience with Pedro felt to me you know wholly different in kind, and because of that, far more rewarding than so much of how these dynamics tend to play out today. I have a clip I would like to to show both of you in our audience. It is from President Biden's Education Secretary, Miguel Cardona, back in December 23rd, 2020, as nominee. Let's listen to what he had to say and then come back with a couple questions. For me, education was the great equalizer. But for too many students, your zip code and your skin color remain the best predictor of the opportunities you'll have in your lifetime. We've allowed what the educational scholar Pedro Noguera calls the normalization of failure to hold back too many of America's children. For far too long, we've allowed students to graduate from high school without any idea of how to meaningfully engage in the workforce, while good-paying, high-skilled, technical, and trade jobs go unfilled. Dr. Noguera, he cites you. What are your expectations of the Biden administration's education department? Well, um, I, I, my hope is, because, you know, what we've seen over the last 20 years or so, um, I, I, let me just take the Trump period out, because I think we didn't get much direction at all during those four years um, in education. But there was a lot of similarity between the Bush administration, the Obama administration, education policy. Real focus on high stakes testing, on uh, standards and accountability of the Common Core, and I'm not against all of that, but I would say it didn't really get at the substance of the issues. And 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 um, Secretary Cardona spoke to it. We have too many kids languishing in too many schools who are not challenged and no one is troubled by it. And that is should disturb all of us. We know that if we're going to use education to promote mobility, to promote opportunity, to address poverty and inequality, then we're going to have to empower kids as learners. We have to make sure they get the skills and education they need so they can contribute to their families and their communities. In many places, that's not happening. So my hope is that this administration will do more than simply give us, um, there, there are no gimmicks, there are no quick fixes. We have to figure out how do we bring, get more parents involved, bring good leaders into schools, make sure that teachers get the support they need and are accountable for results, and make sure that um, the resources our schools need are there. The resources are coming. Now the question is, are, will they be applied in ways that can make a difference for kids? So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, my hopes are high, but, um, you know, my hopes have been high before. So um, although I'm supportive, I'm also um, concerned because um, I don't know if the superintendents and boards out there are getting the guidance they need on how to use these funds to have the greatest impact. Rakesh, uh, what are your thoughts about the tenure of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos under the Trump administration? Did she accomplish anything? She was certainly controversial during her tenure. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think, look, let's be honest. The Trump, I think the Trump administration had a dismal record um, of leg uh, legislatively. I mean, Trump was a destructive, I think, poisonous presence uh, as president. And he put together an administration where nothing functionally got done through Congress, a smattering of bills, even when the Republicans controlled Congress. So legislatively, no, not much got done uh, at the Department of Education. 
I think uh, Secretary DeVos did take some brave stands. I thought uh, what she did on Title IX uh, to ensure that due process would play out on campus was sensible and admirable and in a saner world would have been held up as something that, you know, folks could get behind on both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, I think Secretary DeVos, uh, you know, her biggest accomplishment or her biggest trademark was being a very spoke uh, vocal champion and spokesperson uh, for uh, school choice, for giving families options. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the last year has spoken to why it's so important to give families flexibility uh, to make sure they can find the arrangements that work for them. Um, uh, you know, I, so I think, look, uh, given the realities of that administration, not a lot, not, not a lot legislatively got done. There were executive actions. I do think that you have to grade on a curve because I think the media treatment of Secretary DeVos and the education sector's treatment of her was so unfair and so unhinged and so divorced from any reasonable appraisal of who she was as a person or what she did. Um, that, that that it makes it hard to have, a, you know, a measured conversation um, about the legacy. In your book, uh, the question that you address in your very first chapter seems to be the fundamental question for education policy. That is, what is the purpose of schooling? Do you agree on the answer to that question? Pedro Noguera? Yeah, I don't think we, we, that was an area where we differed much. Um, I think we generally agreed that we can think about the purpose in, you know, kind of multidimensional way in terms of social purposes, um, political and economic. Um, so I, I don't know if we disagreed much. Can you remember, Rick? Is that where we disagreed? I don't think there was a lot of disagreement there on the purpose. But, you know, and, and I think a lot of it was... Uh, tone out, you know, Pedro had a wonderful anecdote in that chapter. Uh, he shared his his father saying to him at some point that um, all you really need uh, for a great education is, you know, a card to the New York City Public Library, um, a library card. And I think Pedro and I got into a really interesting riff on this because I think at one level that's true. Um, I mean, right, this was the secret to Abraham Lincoln's education. On the other hand, you know, when you put it that way, it's clear what's not true about it, that for lots of kids who need, you know, they don't know which books to read. None of us do. Right. When you show up and you're eight and you go to the library, what book should you read? And you don't know how to make sense of the books and you don't know which books should come in which order. And you don't have anybody to answer your questions or provide. So for me, I think one of the places where we I don't know if we agreed or disagreed. But where we got into this really rich conversation was about schools need to be a lot more than just a place where they give you a stack of books. And that's that a hallmark of a successful school, of a successful educator, is that they help you do all the things that make sense out of that. And so the real acid test, I think, of what schools are for is how good a job are they doing um, of adding value to what you could get if you just ordered a stack of materials off the web. Another piece Can of, just oh, sorry, that, go Susan, ahead. Just to uh, clarify but what my father was saying, my father uh, didn't go to college and didn't graduate from high school, but he was an avid reader. And what he told me, he says, you can get a free education with a library card. Um, and because I was off going to college and uh, he said, uh, and uh, he was a person who hadn't gone. He said, I want to make sure that when you go to college, you study something you couldn't have studied free in the library. So when he found out I was going to study sociology and history, he said, you could have studied that for free <laughs> in the <laughs> library. So he was somewhat cynical about the way, you know, we pursue higher education. But it came from a recognition that if you are motivated and if you are stimulated, um, that you can, in fact, take ownership of your education. And that's something I think we lose sight of a lot of times. We're not tapping into the natural curiosity of kids that's there in all children. Next piece of videotape is from George W. Bush in January 8th, 2002, signing uh, the legislation that you've already referred to, No Child Left Behind. Uh, let's watch this. We've got large challenges here in America. There's no greater challenge than to make sure that every child, and all of us on this stage mean every child, not just a few children. 
Every single child, regardless of where they live, how they're raised, the income level of their family, every child received a first-class education in America. America's schools will be on a new path of reform and a new path of results. Our schools will have higher expectations. We believe every child can learn. Our schools will have greater resources to help meet those goals. Parents will have more information about the schools and more say in how their children are educated. Pedro Nogueira, that legislation was not only the outcome of the Bush administration, but Congress and many uh, hearings. And before that, it seemed like years of debate at the National Governors Association with the states crafting this legislation. And we can hear a bipartisan and high hopes for this. But both of you agree that it failed to meet its expectations. What was wrong with what they tried to do with NCSL? So I would say it took us one step forward, and you heard it in the president's remarks. For the first time in this country's history, we had a policy that said we want evidence that all children, regardless of their backgrounds, are learning. The problem was the only evidence we looked at was how well they did on a standardized test. And if you reduce learning to your test score, then you miss out on so many other things that are important. And and unfortunately, that's what we've seen happen where we have this narrow focus on test performance, things like science and history and art and music and phys ed, not on the test. And so what ended up happening in many schools is we narrowed the focus of education when what we should be doing is making sure that all kids get a well-rounded education and that we tap into uh, their their interest in learning. And No Child Behind didn't do that. So I want to acknowledge, though, that from a civil rights standpoint, the president was right. We do need to make sure that all kids, regardless of their background, receive an adequate education. Again, we also need to acknowledge that kids in poor communities are getting something very different than most kids in affluent communities. Rick Hess, you addressed what is known as the achievement gap in one of your chapters. That's what uh, Pedro Noguera is really talking about, the disparate outcomes uh, depending on zip code for students. Uh, when In this particular chapter, you wrote that society needs to fully grapple with the role of racism and school funding in the, in the achievement gap, but, quote, also with the role of individual choices and personal behavior. What are you saying? Um, you know, the, <laughs> what it seems to me obvious is that, you know, we talk, uh, we're talking a lot at this moment in this country about systemic disparities. Uh, my friend Pedro has been talking, you know, exqui- you know, thoughtfully and expansively about these for decades. And we do need to wrestle with these. Um, and we do need to take a look at where funds are being spent. And I would suggest that some of the sweeping assertions about funding and equity are simply inconsistent with the empirical record. But the larger point is funding should be equitable. And we should wrestle with exactly what equitable means. But what, what, I, what I'm deeply concerned by in some of the conversation today uh, is a suggestion that talk of personal responsibility, the talk of the need for students to also be in, invested um, in behaving responsibly, that somehow these things are artifacts of racism, that they are problematic, that, that, that to talk in this way is somehow to uh, suggest is to blame the student for their plight. And it seems to me that two things are true at once. We need to wrestle with systemic issues. We need to make sure every kid is getting the kinds of instruction and support and pedagogy and opportunities that Pedro just alluded to. But we also need to unapologetically say that students and parents have certain responsibilities, and we ought to uniformly expect that we will also do our parts as individuals. Pedro Noguera, there's a related chapter in your book, which you both take up the questions of diversity and equity in education. I'd say this is one where you failed to reach common ground between the two of you. What separates your, uh, your views on these issues with regard to schools? You know, we live in a society that has uh, historically been divided on the basis of race. Um, it was only in 1954 that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that separate 
but equal was um, profoundly unequal and inherently contributed to the disparities in our society. What we need to acknowledge is, is that over six years later, we still have many kids attending racially separate and unequal schools. In fact, uh, we didn't even live up to the promise of Brown or the promise of Plessy, which at least said separate but equal. Um, as long as we maintain these kind of inequities, then our ability to ensure that all kids, regardless of where they live, can contribute to them, themselves and to our society is gonna be limited. And that's what we see today. Today, to go to Rick's point about personal responsibility, a low-income kid with an A average has less of a chance of graduating from college than an affluent kid with a C average. Why? Because college is increasingly unaffordable. And that low-income kid will probably have to work their way through school and may not be able to finish because of the debt burden they have to take on. These are ways in which we actually hurt our nation because there are so many talented people who cannot contribute fully because education is not available. Um, so I think there's a lot we could do, and there are many other countries who are showing us we can invest in education in ways that make it more accessible um, and that will benefit all of us. But just following up with that, in the clip we had with Secretary Cardona, he referenced as well the necessity for trade education in America's schools, something that it seems we've gotten away from in the past couple of decades. Should every child have the opportunity to go to college? Or are, we, are we really on, on the right road regarding college education and all students? No, I would agree with that. I think we have to give people lots of options. There are a lot of people who don't want to go to college, and there are a lot of people who are much more interested in learning a trade, and that, we should make that available. As long as, you know, when I was in school, <laughs> there used to be uh, about middle school, they would tell you either on the college track or you're on a vocational track. It tended to be the poor kids were on the vocational track, middle class kids were on the college track. As long as we're not doing that and, and it's to making judgments about kids early, uh, then it makes sense. Yes, people do need trades. And there are a lot of fields where you don't need a college degree. So I have no objection to that at all. I think that career and technical education should be um, made available to a lot more communities around the country. Rick Hess, you agree? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of moving parts here. Um, one, we absolutely need to make sure the doors of opportunity to open every kid. And opportunity should, again, it should be, um, both societal commitment to making sure kids have a chance, but also individuals should have a say in what they're going to do. Part of the problem here is the college for all ha has been uh, aggravated because we have uh, this phenomenon that, that has been allowed to grow up um, around a mis well, what I've long argued is a misinterpretation of the Civil Rights Act of 64, which allows employers to discriminate on college degrees whether or not those degrees are relevant to the job at hand. If you're applying to work behind the counter, uh, renting cars, or um, being an assistant manager at a coffee shop, it's entirely unclear to me why an employer should be allowed to require you to have a college degree, especially in a mass online ad, uh, rather than opening the doors uh, to people to demonstrate based on work experience and skills that they can do the job. So I think there's a lot of questions that get bundled in here. Partly it's about making sure um, students have avenues to opportunity that meet their interests and their skills and their needs. Uh, partly it's about making sure we're not allowing structures of convenience to close doors of opportunity on the other side. Um, and, you know, and I think, uh, I think one of the play, Pedro and I disagree about a lot of particulars here. So for instance, Pedro referenced both Plessy and Brown. One of my strong concerns is we now have affinity group meetings, not just in colleges, but in some high schools, where we get kids together based on the color of their skin, which seems to my mind to be walking us backwards rather than forwards towards, you know, the kind of nation I'd like us to live in and my children grow up in in the 21st century. But that, that, that aside, I think where Pedro and I can find a lot of common ground here is these practical questions of how do we open up these opportunities and remove blockages. And I think where we as a country tend to get stuck is the further we move from these practical questions, the more towards sweeping assertions of what's at work, that's when we all wind up going back to our corners and just, you know, hurling stuff back and forth. Would you like to respond, Pedro Degar? Yeah, I, I, I would agree that I, I think that finding ways to um, 
bridge our differences is essential in this country, right? Differences, whether they be racial, um, socioeconomic, or political. Um, to the degree that we are fighting each other, we're not addressing our common problems. And, and education should play a role in helping us to figure out how to do that. In fact, that was one of the motivations I had for doing this book with Rick, is to demonstrate you can have dialogue and, and, and disagree respectfully with each other. And I think this school should be places where that happens. Unfortunately, our communities tend to be uh, more segregated, both in terms of race and socioeconomic status. And so unless we create opportunities for people to learn together, then we're going to find our society continues to be very fragmented. And I think that's a threat to our future. Uh, Rick Hess, in the book, you argue that schools should equip every single child for citizenship. Recently, six former secretaries of education, obviously bipartisan, co-signed a Wall Street Journal op-ed calling for the country to, quote, reinvigorate teaching and learning of American history and civics in our nation's schools, end quote. They further observed that, quote, we collectively spend about 1,000 times more per student on science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM education, than we do on history and civics. That's got to ring uh, near and dear to a former social studies teacher's heart. Uh, obviously, you agree with this, but have we neglected civics education in favor of STEM over the past decade? Uh, well, I mean, we've certainly neglected civics education. Um, I think we've actually neglected it and uh, STEM to a certain extent, to back to Pedro's point, on no child left behind. Uh, there's this old social science nostrum called Campbell's Law, which points out that when you measure certain things uh, in the world, you tend to focus on those rather than others. And I think what Pedro and I both have experienced over the last 20 years uh, in the aftermath of No Child Left Behind was the degree to which all of the machinery and culture and focus of people up and down school systems and education policy kind of gravitated towards moving those grades three to eight reading and math scores and how much that pulled the attention and the energy and the focus away from everything else. Um, and while science was tested three times, once in elementary, middle, and high school as part of NCLB, there was zero attention paid to civics or social studies. So yeah, I, I think it has been massively shortchanged. Um, one of the problems here is that efforts to address that very easily can fall prey both to our ideological polarization, um, either because the way we talk about the importance of civics is because, well, we need civics so that we don't elect somebody like that, which immediately puts us all on our polarization alert, um, or because we get into something like action civics, which, to my mind, when done poorly, and I've too often seen it done poorly, um, is more about getting kids to be partisan and enge than it is to actually teach them to wrestle with tough issues. So I think we've massively underinvested. I think we need to do tons better. I think kids need to know much more about this country and the responsibilities of citizenship. Um, I think getting from here to there is actually really tricky, like with all of this. Well, how would you do it, Pedro Noguera? How do you teach to find consensus around the teaching of civics education in this changing society? That's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about that because I agree with um, the, the Rick's point that we need to um, not only do we need to make sure we're teaching it, um, civics and history, we need to invigorate it, right, so that it really means something to kids. But as soon as you start to delve in those topics, you get into the, the many debates and controversies of American history. You know, so, for example, you think about um, the, the fact that many of the founding fathers were slave owners. How do you teach that in school in ways that acknowledges both their contributions but also the moral flaw of owning other people and fathering children with them that you never recognize. I think you can't avoid those issues, but the, the, the real question is how do you debate them in ways that prepare you to address the ongoing um, uh, contradictions of our society? So we've been thinking a lot about, well, maybe what we should do is offer courses, um, uh, what they call MOOCs, uh, a multi, uh, I, I forget the acronym, but basically courses to high school kids on topics, we're, we're thinking about immigration as a topic because the United States is a nation of immigrants. Immigration is an issue that has divided our nation. Um, let's, let's go into that issue in a way that provides our students with the, uh, uh, the, the 
facts and understanding of how immigration has shaped our country, but also an understanding of the ways it continues to uh, both shape our society and, in many cases, divide us. Um, I don't think we should shy away from the debates, but we should figure out how to approach them intelligently so that students come away better prepared as citizens to participate in our democracy. That should be the role of civics education. We have about 15 minutes left in our hour with the two of you, and I want to go back to education policy. Here is 2015, President Obama signing in the NCLB, No Child Left Behind's replacement legislation, which was called Every Student Succeeds, ESSA. Let's watch. The goals of No Child Left Behind, the predecessor of this law, were the right ones. High standards, accountability, closing the achievement gap, making sure that every child was learning, not just some. But in practice, it often fell short. We've got to learn what works and do more of that, and we've got to get rid of the stuff that doesn't work. And that's exactly what the Every Student Succeeds Act does. This is a big step in the right direction. A true bipartisan effort, a reminder of what can be done when people enter into Uh, these issues in a spirit of of listening and compromise. So returning to both of you, there was consensus, I can even tell you from our perch at C-SPAN, listening to the debates in Congress and the teachers that we would have participate in our programs, that the testing emphasis was wrong and no child left behind. And so Washington took another swing at it. What did they get right and what did they get wrong with this successor legislation? Pedro Nogueira? I think what they got right is that you have to use assessment as a tool um, to guide learning, uh, not merely to rank kids, rank teachers, or rank schools. So I think in that way, ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, does represent, again, uh, uh, a a significant step forward. However, when I travel the country and talk to uh, uh, state commissioners and superintendents, what I hear is they're still kind of focused on no child behind. Um, They don't really know how to loosen things up um, in ways that will uh, uh, enable schools and teachers to um, do what the law allows. Um, And so I'm concerned that without more guidance, we're not going to see a big change in the way we're delivering education to kids. Um, But I do want to acknowledge at least the policymakers were trying to correct some of the mistakes of um, the previous administration. Previous law, no child behind. Rakesh, you write in the book that ESSA changed school testing regime for the better. How do you how do you see it doing that? Yeah, I mean, but Pedro is also exactly right on this one. I mean, it's interesting how uh, in something like educational culture, these things put put their hooks in um, and start to change them. Uh, look, in some sense, when you do big legislation, you're always fighting the last battle. So, no child left behind was intended to deal with the fact that. The Clinton administration in 94 had offered money to all the states in something that we call the Improving America Schools Act to go ahead and create report cards and test kids in reading and math and elementary middle. And the states took the money and then only like one out of five states actually did what they promised. So that's how you got like 390 members of the House and 90 in the Senate to vote for NCLB. They were all ready to put that put, put hammer and tongs to the states. And then in 2015, Everybody said, holy cow, boy, did we overshoot. Uh, We didn't mean it to play out that way. So what ESSA did was it's, you know, it's easy to think about the most important parts of No Child Left Behind is a three-part accountability system. You had to test kids and grades three to eight in reading and math and then a couple of things, you know, and once in high school. Um, You had to use these tests to decide which schools were making what they called adequate yearly progress, so making or failing to make AYP. And then they had a series of interventions that Washington mandated that states had to do. And it turned out that we were labeling like 90% of America's schools as failing by about 2010 because um, turns out that grading all these schools on these subgroups of reading and math tests was a problem. Uh, Nobody actually thought the interventions were doing any good. (laughs) So what ESSA did was it kept the transparency part. It said you still have to test kids grades three to eight every year in reading and math, and then once again in high school, and you had to do three grades of science testing. But it got rid of the narrow Washington direction on how to say whether a school was making adequate early progress, and it did away with 
Washington's mandated interventions. But Pedro's point, again, is that when you talk to educators, even five, six years later, this is still the mindset that they've become accustomed to. Um, schools organize their improvement strategies around these reading and math tests uh, that are federally mandated. And as we think about the challenges of the pandemic, as we think about reconnecting millions of kids who just fell off our radar during the pandemic, or all the kids who were locked up at home and feel frustrated and isolated. What we need are our tools that help us figure out what they need, that help educators and policymakers see how well we're responding to their needs, that help us get creative about, well, where do we go forward? And ESSO is certainly an improvement over NCLB, but it just wasn't designed to help us do any of the stuff I just said. As our clock ticks down here, let me turn to the issue that both of you describe as one of the most, <clears throat> excuse me, contentious in the book, and that's school choice. For some people, the prescription of, of what ails uh, public education in the country. Uh, Rick, I, I took away from the book, uh, Rick has, uh, from one paragraph that you wrote, that you have broad support for school choice in all of its various formats. Uh, what do you think it solves or what it brings to the table for parents and students? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I generally support all the flavors of school choice from charter schools to school vouchers to education savings accounts to what have you. Um, I think a couple of things. One, Pedro has, I think, eloquently talked about some of the inequities in American education. And I think given that those of us who have the resources to move into communities with good schools or to attend private schools um, have strategies for making sure our kids get something School choice is a way to empower those who don't have those resources. So that's one piece. I think a second piece is that one of my great frustrations with American education is the degree to which bureaucracies get in the way of educators and school leaders and superintendents and problem solvers who are trying to figure out how to make things work. Uh, the learning pandemic learning pods that we've seen emerge. And I think school choice is a way to allow the system to do what it does while creating avenues for educators and problem solvers to come up with better and more promising solutions. And third, look, uh, when push comes to shove, I'm a believer in empowering individual families to figure out what works best for them and for their children. And absent powerful reasons to the contrary, um, I tend to lean towards you know, giving families more discretion. Pedro Nogueira, in, in one of your longest back and forths on any issue in this book, you ended up calling this topic complicated. Why? It's complicated because I want to acknowledge that affluent parents always have choice. Uh, they don't like what's uh, available in the public schools. They'll go private. They'll move. They'll do whatever they want. Um, and I, I've done that myself. I've been able to, if I don't like uh, the school my kids have been assigned to, I'll figure out a way to get them into a better school. It's low in comparison to who don't have that choice. Um, what concerns me and the, the complication comes in is that many choice systems we've seen implemented have exacerbated inequities. There are certain kids that are never chosen. That is that the, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged kids, homeless kids, kids in foster care, who are their advocates? How do we make sure that those kids have access to good schools? I haven't seen a choice system yet that makes sure that all kids are getting a good education. So uh, my feeling is that unless there are all good choices, choice often exacerbates inequity and creates winners and losers. And that's something that none of us should applaud. As we close here, uh, the way we've structured public school in the United States, there's just so many interested parties, teachers, administrators, teachers unions, school boards, PTAs, district administrators, state regulators, the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Pedro, uh, you use the metaphor, how do we get the oars all pulling in the same direction? With such a complicated system, what's the answer to that question? You know, my hope is, and I think this is one of the goals of the book, is that we depoliticize education. <laughs> uh, it, we, we can't afford, education should be like healthcare. <laughs> it should be like infrastructure. It should be apolitical. It, it should not be- Healthcare's kind of political I though, isn't it? <laughs> I know, those are all political too. <laughs> but you know, there are certain things that are just in our interest as a nation. Educating our kids is in our interest as a nation. If we could figure out a way to not fight about that, um, I, it would help us all because the more energy we put into fighting, 
the less energy we and, and imagination we have for solving problems. Rick Hess? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I, I think I'm more of a cynical person than Pedro. Um, you know, the progressives tried to depoliticize education a century ago, and I think, you know, they made school board elections nonpartisan and off cycle. And I think the main thing is that the people who wound up showing up were people who had uh, an intense grievance or worked for the schools. So I think these things are always complicated. Um, but but I, but I think Pedro's intuition, the oars pulling in this direction, is, is right, and I think we share it. And I think two things we can do is, look, we're always going to have big, broad disagreements about lots of things that affect schools, because schools are about our children and our common future and who we want to be as a country. So, of course, we're going to disagree, and it's going to be heated. But one, I think what Pedro and I found is the more we can talk enough uh, that we can get to some of the practical pragmatic things, uh, we can find a lot more places where we're actually looking at things in similar ways and where our common expectations are more aligned. Um, and then I think the second thing is part of the problem in our debates today is because we mostly talk, well, mostly we don't talk to anybody. Uh, and a lot of policy and advocacy roles, people spend a lot of time firing off tweets or writing angry op-eds or doing radio hits. And so all we know of each other is what we see in a tweet or, or hear in a 30 second radio cut. Um, and that makes us think, man, this guy just doesn't get it. He doesn't care. She's out to lunch. And one of the things I think for me that really came out of this exercise is that the more Pedro and I had a chance to go into, not just it's complicated because we know that, but when we were talking about choice, and I, and, and I could concede, all right, these are fair questions you're raising, uh, my friend, about, you know, the kids who are getting left behind. But what are you going to tell me about public school districts that are already not serving these kids? The more we could wrestle with that, the more I, 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 I could talk to him, at least in a way that trusted that he wasn't just trying to score debate points. And I think that's a lot. I think if we could get that, if we can get one, a more pragmatic focus, and two, uh, spend time engaging in these things with a little more trust and a little less defensiveness about debate points, that especially in communities and at the state level, um, we could get a lot more, we, we, we could find ways to get a lot more done than we can right now. Well, the book is called A Search for Common Ground, Conversations About the Toughest Questions in K-12 Education. Pedro Noguera, Rick Hess, the authors, the two who have debated these issues back and forth, we only got to a few of them. So we invite people to find the book and hear more of what you have to say on these topics. Thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening. You might also be interested in our newest podcast, Book Notes Plus. C-SPAN's Brian Lamb is taking the concept from his long-running book note series and tailoring it for a podcast audience. You'll hear a mix of new interviews with nonfiction authors and historians and some favorites from the Book Notes archives. You can find Book Notes Plus wherever you get your podcasts.